Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak to you today, um, and uh, for Anna for all your help coordinating getting me here this morning. I appreciate that. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about some research that we've done, both McMaster and elsewhere, about um, finding a reliable and valid way to assess our trainees to both medical school and postgraduate training programs. So in terms of disclosure, um, my only disclosure is that I currently hold uh, one of the Stemler grants for the, from the National Board of Medical Education looking at some of these research projects. Today, some of our objectives are going to be to understand uh, and evaluate the current evidence supporting the reliability and validity of various admissions and evaluation measure, measures, to determine how to evaluate and recruit potential applicants, um, because we want people not with just good medical knowledge or who can develop good medical knowledge, but who are good communicators, collaborators, um, and have what we call good personal and professional characteristics. So before we think about what we want in our medical trainees, I think we need to think a little bit about what we want in our practicing physicians. So we want people who have good use of diagnostic tests, good prescribing practices, good patient survival after cardiac incident where applicable, lack of calls to state and other medical boards, and good peer review. There's evidence that all of these things are what we're looking for in our practicing physicians. And in addition, all of these things are actually predicted by performance on national licensing exams. So when we're thinking about our admissions process or any evaluation that we're doing, we want to have sort of these long-term goals in mind that we can use uh, as surrogates for what we're trying to do at the admissions level. So there's a dilemma in admissions. We have large applicant pools, especially at the undergraduate level, to select from. So how do we know that we're getting the right applicants for our program? We know that once we admit people, it tend to difficult, tends to be difficult to remove a trainee from the program or even to remediate people who we find having problems, let alone identifying the problems themselves. We tend to want a combination of cognitive and what we call personal or professional characteristics also called non-cognitive skills. We know from a cognitive perspective we have very good predictors of how people are going to do. But there's limited reliability and validity of most of the measures that we use to assess personal and professional characteristics. But does it really matter? Well, many of you are probably familiar with the studies done by Maxine Papadakis, which show that 92% of the problems called the state medical boards are due to professionalism issues. And if you combine that with a study done by Mello looking at the national cost of medical liability, that adds up to about $30 billion. So it is a bit of an issue and maybe one that we want to address at the admissions level. So here comes my football slide. Um, if I liken the admissions process or the evaluation process anyway to scouting a football player. I'm a big football fan. Uh, up in Canada, and this is our local team, the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Um, so if you were scouting a quarterback for your team, would you want to send one scout to one game, one scout to five games, two scouts to five games, or would you want to send five scouts to ten different games? I've sort of loaded the answer a little bit. I'm sure you can guess what the right answer is. But you want to see that player in as many different field uh, conditions with different player injuries against different teams in different situations to get an idea of what type of player that is. The same holds true for any assessment that we do. The more multiple independent samples that we can get of anybody's performance across conditions, across contexts, the better assessment we're going to have of them. This is true at any level. We know it's true clinically. We wouldn't want to say somebody is clinically competent based on a single evaluation. And the same is true at admissions. We want as many multiple independent samples of that person in order to determine whether or not they'd be a good fit for our program. So in order to get a reliable assessment, we need to first talk about what reliability is. I don't know how many of you have a bit of a psychometric background, but reliability is the ability to consistently discriminate between people on whatever quality uh, it is that you want. It's a score between zero and one, with one being perfectly reliable. So it's a test that will always differentiate uh, the pool, that, a pool of applicants that you're looking at. So we know that for high stakes tests, we want the reliability of whatever assessment we do to be somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9.
We also know that inter-rater reliability, so that's the agreement between two raters on the same person's performance, tends to be about 0.64, which is pretty good, so we tend to agree with ourselves. The problem tends to be it w is with inter interview reliability. So that's the problem with most traditional interviews, is that you tend to bring somebody in and they go into one or two interview rooms with a variety of different people in the same room, um, a variety of different raters. And if you have three or four raters in the same room interviewing somebody, you're not taking care of the measurement error which exists. So we find that most of the measurement error, most of the problem, tends to come from the interview itself. So the more interviews we can have, the more we can spread that person across different contexts, talking about different questions, the more reliable it's going to be. And just to give you a bit of a, a graphical uh, demonstration, uh, taking those 18 raters and having them all in one room, which would not only be very intimidating to the applicant coming in, uh, is, is actually a bit of a waste of resources. You're better to take those 18 raters and spread them across 18 different stations, each asking their own question, to get a more reliable measure. So that leads us to the solution, which is an admissions OSCE called the multiple mini interview. Uh, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. It's done quite a bit in Canada and is increasingly uh, prevalent in the States. It's very similar to an OSCE, but we don't call it an OSCE. Um, it's multiple stations on diverse topics where the candidate actually rotates between stations with a different interviewer in each station. Um, all of the interviewers give independent ratings on that candidate's performance at where they're answering open-ended questions. So they have a couple of minutes outside the door, then they go in and they in engage with the interviewer anywhere from five to ten minutes long. Then they leave the room, there's two minutes while they're reading the next stem on the next door where the interviewer is scoring them. So the interviewer sees all the candidates going through answering the same question. They're provided a background in theory so they know how to score these questions. And what it does is it eliminates the halo effect. The halo effect is that really unintentional first impression bias that we're all subject to. And it's if you come in and you're really nervous on the first question and you really mess it up, you get a fresh start with the MMI in the next station because that next interviewer has no idea how you did. But with the traditional interview, the interviewers, sorry, my screen's just going dark. The interviewers all know how you did on that first station or the first question and that biases the way they interpret the rest of your your questions so even if you don't do well on the first one and then you do subsequently well on the rest of them it's still going to have a negative carryover to how they score you overall so the stations that are evaluated on the MMI are all geared to be non-medical expert so they may cover things such as communication collaboration ethics empathy, those types of station. They may be geared into a medical setting, but they're all meant to not tap into the medical expert knowledge. So I'm going to give you an example station. This is one that we used in postgraduate admissions up in Canada, so it, is, uh, it does have a bit of a Canadian twist to it. Um, the CanMeds roles are similar yet different from the ACGME competencies. They're all listed here. So we said that the CanMeds group wants to uh, remove two of the identified roles of a good physician. And then we've listed the CanMeds roles for them. So medical expert, collaborator, communicator, manager, health advocate, scholar, and professional. Acknowledging that they're all desirable, which two roles would you remove from the list? And have included in your discussion with the interviewer why these roles would be of lesser value to the field of pediatrics. So as you can imagine, that's a fairly difficult question to answer. Um, because all of these seem like good roles and they would have to defend their answer. In the multiple mini interview, there's no right or no wrong answer. It wasn't that we were looking for two particular um, uh, roles for them to remove. It's the way they defend their answer that is really the key. To give you an example of another station, I'm going to need two volunteers that uh, I've asked Erica to help me nominate. So is anyone It's a fun station, I promise, and I promise I won't make you go through the whole thing. Canadians have a very rare sense of humor, though. <laughs> well, I, I nominate Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that one's cool. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Catherine? This is perfect. So I'm going to give you this. 
And when I ask you to, I'm just going to ask you to face the back of the room. Okay? Yeah, you can face the front of the room. I have to give you instructions. So, is it Scott? Scott. Okay. So, this is an interactive station. In this particular station, we actually ask two candidates to come into the room at the same time, and they each have their own interviewer. So, in this particular situation, there is a giver and a receiver of information. In this particular situation, Scott is the giver, and Catherine is the receiver. So, when you, st you start, you'll find two copies of the same complex dot-to-dot -dot drawing. One copy will be drawn for you, and the other will not. So Catherine has an incomplete dot-to-dot -dot drawing. Um, Catherine is not going to be able to look at you, but she may talk to you, and you may talk to her. Um, she has dots only and no numbers. So you need to verbally guide her to recreate the drawing in front of you. So Catherine, if I can get you to turn around, just so you can't see. All right, so go ahead. I don't know where, so she just has all these dots but no numbers. Right, no numbers. Scott, do I start with diagram B being clearly red? What did you just say? Diagram B. Diagram yeah. B. Yes, that's yes, diagram B, yes, okay. I see. I'm going to orient it this way. And she, she has no idea where to start. No idea where to start. That's all up to you. Okay. Well, so the object. I can't. Can I? Can I tell them what the object? You can is? say anything you would like. Okay. So the, these dots have to cut. The, the drawing you're trying to create is a uh, helicopter. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> you can. I can. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Here. It's not artistic. Scott, there's a circle already. Do I start there? Where's number one? The goal, the goal is not necessarily in this to recreate the drawing. The goal is to look at how they give and receive instruction. Right. So the. So Scott doesn't give it. Yeah. It's good that I'm not the receiver. I don't take instructions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, number one is on the right hand side, at about four o'clock. Um, is, it, is, there a, is there a circle I, on that side? Yes, I do. I see a circle there. Okay, so if that's a clock, so about 10 o'clock on that circle is number circle, one. Circle, 10 o'clock. Is that the dot closest to the circle? Uh, no, there's one further away. Same line, but further away. Okay. And so, so you're going to go up from there. Like I said, no, actually, are you gonna, I, can't, I can't see these numbers, so I can't. Scott, I need one point of clarification. The dot that I'm starting with, I just want to make sure, directly below it, and I'm directly below it, is there another dot? Yes. Okay, good. So I think I have the right number one. Perfect. Now, you want me to go up? No, I think I, what, what you want to do is to go northwest from there. Northwest. I. Well, actually, I, is this is this one? Or I can't I can't see. That's okay. I'll I'll stop you there. I think that you were doing well. Oh. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, you were doing very well. So the goal in this, Catherine, you can turn around. Thank you both so much. Uh, so the goal in this was to not necessarily create the object or create the. Um, helicopter. In this particular station, the candidates had five minutes to talk to each other, to try and do the best they could to orient each other um, towards it. And then they had three minutes uh, left of the eight-minute station to debrief each other on how they think it went. Um, it's actually a very enlightening station. Um, it's a high-stakes evaluation, so we actually get some uh, tempers flaring during this station, which it, it was quite uh, interesting to see. Um, but that, that's just to give you an example of the types of, of stations that we go through. So what is, I mean, it, this has all been fun. Well, fun for those of us who weren't interacting. You know, yes? What are you trying to do is see if people, communication skills and teamwork? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Communication skills, teamwork, collaboration, those sorts of things. So it, it's very interesting because, I mean, you started to use, uh, I'm just going to excuse for one second while I change my battery here. Um, you started to use north by northwest, 
which in a lot of these samples, or a lot of these interactions, people didn't know what, how to orientate themselves to north to northwest. So they would say, can I have a, can I have a clock, can I, those sorts of things. And, and those were really the interesting uh, and demonstrative, sorry, I'm just going to get to the right slide here, very demonstrative parts of it. So it wasn't necessarily that we were waiting to see an angry interaction. It was just we were waiting to see how they interacted, waiting to see how they collaborated at the end and gave each other feedback um, and whether or not they took that feedback. Taking feedback in a very high stakes evaluation where you're being evaluated by somebody else is very difficult for a lot of people. So when you know the interviewer is looking over your shoulder about to score you and somebody's giving you some negative feedback, that can be very hard to hear. So what do we know about how the MMI performs in an admission situation? Well, at the undergraduate level, we know from a reliability standpoint, which as I mentioned before, is that score between 0 and 1, we know MCAT scores do quite well. We know undergraduate grade point average is also very reliable. Unfortunately, the traditional interview and even when that traditional interview is standardized with respect to the questions, perform quite poorly in terms of its ability to re be reliable. Now, the MMI with two stations is absolutely no different. Where the difference comes is when we get up to a nine station multiple mini interview, because it's those multiple independent samples that are able to allow us to discriminate between good and bad candidates on the qualities that we're interested in. So it's being able to see them not in one station or two stations, but up to nine different stations performing different tasks and activities. How did you evaluate whether the fact that nine is better than two? Um, we did a, uh, we used generalizability theory which is uh, a formula which allows us to calculate the measurement error due to station, due to rater, due to applicant, and tells us how much variance is coming from each of those. And then we can do a decision study, which just says if we had two stations, because you divide by the number of stations, so if we could do a decision study, which would tell us the reliability with two stations. You didn't use graduation or grades of graduation as an outcome? Not at this point. In the next slide, though, thank you for leading into that. That was very nice. Um, we look at the predictive validity of, I think my pointer died. Sorry, my computer's just freezing for a second. Is this undergraduate medical? Yes, so this is at undergraduate medical admissions. Sure. Um, creating the stations is actually fairly uh, easy. Um, it's what we tend to do, and I was going to talk about this later, so I'll talk about it now. Thank you. Um, we tend to think uh, and get people to brainstorm around the qualities of interest that they have with their applicants when they want to bring them in. We do, of course, have our blueprinted qualities. We want people who are good communicators or collaborators. But what other things or situations might you be able to bring to the table? So you can think about situations you may have had with your residences or training or even in life uh, and create the situation from there. So we have the giving bad news station where um, you unfortunately gave uh, a missed dose to a neonatal patient. So you moved the decimal place over uh, and gave instead of 0.4, I think it was 4.0 uh, of, of a medication. So it was just a, a medication error. We have uh, a lot of uh, communication stations which um, you, for example, one, you're overhearing your staff person or you're about to be staff person who you're going to start with and they're making some inappropriate racial comments to um, another resident who you have to go and work with and it's, it's that your, whatever comment they're making, your partner is from that specific uh, cultural group. How do you address this or do you address it? Um, so dealing with those issues of not only authority but cultural issues as well um, is another one. We tend to um, try and get people, you know, if, if somebody in a particular group is not pulling their weight, what do you do, how do you interact with that, those types of stations we try and get them to engage in. We also do have stations which are much more um, having people tell people, uh, you know, give us an example of a time that you failed 
talk to us about that failure and what you learned from it. So those types of more situational judgment tasks. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You, you, you started with certain assumptions about what we, the collective we, mm -hmm. would like as physicians. And I would put out for discussion that schools can be very different. Absolutely. Some that are very focused and some that are very, very broad. And while everybody would like to have smart people that are so much compassion to work together and love apple pie, not every school would follow beyond that. I 100% I agree with you. Um, I mean, I give you examples, and as we sort of, you'll see as I went through, we ask, we engage to this at the postgraduate level, and we asked each program to engage in a process that allowed them to look at the roles and responsibilities and the qualities that were important to them uh, as a program. And we did this with um, orthopedics, pediatrics, um, ob internal medicine, programs that are fairly different from in terms of perspective. They found some overlapping areas and some areas where it was slightly different. Um, I mean, I'm not uh, saying anything, but orthopedic surgery and pediatrics required different characteristics in their trainees that they brought in. So it, it's a, we do, there, there are some, uh, the ACGME competencies I know have some criteria of the things that you would want to. In Canada, we have the CANMEDS roles, um, which identify a lot of those things. But I think the ACGME competencies are similar to the CANMEDS in that there's a lot of room for interpretation in some of them. They're fairly broad descriptions. So, and, and I think we'll addre hopefully address that point a little bit more, but I'm happy to come back to it as well. Um, what we do know in terms of predictive validity, um, and this is where we look at how things correlate with those national licensing exam performances, we sort of group them into cognitive and personal and professional characteristics. So cognitive may include third year GPA, um, and we've included third year here because this part was done at McMaster, um, and McMaster uh, lets people in after three years of undergraduate training. The USMLE step through, step three, the Medical Council of Canada qualifying exam part one, we have a two-step licensing exam in Canada. This part one is written at the end of medical school. Um, the part two, which you'll see below, is comprised of an OSCE exam, and it's more personal and professional characteristics, and it includes the C2LEO, which is the cultural communication, legal, ethical, and organizational component, um, which we've labeled as personal professional characteristics. So what you'll see is GPA, um, as undergraduate GPA coming into medical school, is predictive of um, USMLE Step 3 uh, and a Part 1 of the Medical Council exam, but is not predictive um, and is actually negatively correlated with some of these personal professional characteristics. What we've been able to look at with the MMI so far is how it correlates with these things. And what we've seen is a very low to negative correlation with the cognitive components but a positive correlation with the personal professional characteristics, which is exactly what we were hoping for in terms of using a combination of grade point average and MMI in order to admit people to our medical school allows us to have that balance of the cognitive and non-cognitive components. Was your hand up? Yeah. Um, postgraduate GPA, um, the way we count postgraduate GPA is just it's an additional percentage if you've done a master's, an additional percentage if you've done a PhD, and we actually haven't found any difference. Um, we have a bit of a non-traditional medical school in that you're not required to have um, the MCAT that we now require up till a couple years ago we didn't actually require the MCAT. We now only require the MCAT verbal reasoning component of it. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have the science background, so we already have a bit of a non-traditional route um, coming in, so it didn't make a huge difference for us from the postgraduate perspective. But I think at other schools it, it might have a huge difference. So just to give you a, a little bit of a summary, um, in terms of the reliability, the MMI does have 
uh, a more reliable process than the traditional interview, even when the traditional interview is standardized. And from a validity standpoint, um, the MMI does have uh, predictive validity for these components of the national licensing exam, whereas the traditional interview doesn't demonstrate uh, these predictive components. But what about postgrad? Uh, this, all this evidence that I've pre been presenting to you up till now is all from undergraduate education, but nationally and internationally, most postgraduate programs still use a traditional interview process for their admissions. So in 2008 uh, and on, uh, with the University of Alberta and McMaster, we involved medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, CMGs and IMGs. CMGs are Canadian medical graduates, IMGs are international medical graduates in this process. Uh, to look at using the MMI and we had a seven station MMI as well as one personal interview station that we used and this was for their CARMS process. So this is our Canadian residency matching service similar to the matching uh, process you use here in the States where it's a combination of the students ranking and the programs ranking. Subsequently we've added orthopedics uh, both at McMaster and the University of British Columbia and pediatrics in Ottawa to this pool of programs uh, that are using the MMI together. Um, and this is where we engage them in the process and what they care about. Uh, so we ask them to think about what they want in their residence. Not only what do they want in their residence upon graduation, but what do they want in their first year residence who are coming in? What type of training program do they have? Do they spend a lot of time teaching them communication skills or teaching them to collaborate or about empathy or advocacy skills, those types of things? Do they want them to have those skills coming in and not teach them? Um, so we look, talked about looking at good and bad examples of current residents uh, and brainstorming a little bit about the types of qualities they might find interesting. We then had them engage in a paired comparison method. As you, you noticed probably from that CanMed's MMI example, it's very hard to eliminate one of these qualities um, from the list that I gave you because they all seem like good things that a physician should have. So by engaging in a paired comparison, it's a forced choice process where we pitted um, uh, empathy versus collaboration skills and say if you had to pick between empathy and collaboration which would you pick and force them to choose between all the different pairing combinations of it uh, and it actually ended up giving us this is an example of uh, what obstetrics came up with um, ended up allowing us to assign a numeric value to each of the qualities that they were interested in now these numeric values can be used for blueprinting later you can actually say that ethics is twice as important for them than critical thinking skills. And this was just their perspective. I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. This is what the Department of Obstetrics at McMaster came up with. But it is unique to each program in each school. And I think that can't be underscored. There may be overlapping areas. There may be um, interactive. You may want uh, to see how your uh, students do with an interactive task like the dot to dot drawing. But it doesn't mean that all the stations will be the same. In terms of evaluation, the MMI is evaluated by an individual faculty or resident. Uh, they're provided with a background in theory as well as probing questions and they do some benchmarking. So after they've seen four or five candidates go through, they will then um, assess their scores because they may have assigned them very high points on the nine point scale and they may want to adjust them down or adjust them up after they've seen a few. They evaluate all the residents coming through on communication skills, strength of their argument and overall performance. They're asked to give general comments and make sure they write a lot of comments for each of their candidates that come through because they may be seeing 30 or 40 students in a day answering the same question. It's important to remember who said what. Uh, and we also have a spot for red flags. So red flags was anything we identified as egregious unprofessionalism. So that would be the person yelling at the other candidate in the dot to dot station. It could be somebody making a very unprofessional comment about somebody they did an elective with. Those types of things would be flagged uh, and brought up for, for further review. At that point, those people who are flagged, they're not necessarily taken out, but you could decide not to rank them. And we ask people to err on the side of flagging someone if they're not sure, even if it's a very small thing, because across nine or ten stations, somebody may get four or five or six flags for very, very small reasons, but once you see multiple ones of those, you think that this could be potentially a problem student. In terms of the results that we found, it's very, uh, I just showed you a few of the results here, but the pattern is the same. So the inter item is the communication to strength of argument to overall performance. Those are very highly correlated. So if somebody received an eight on communication, they probably received an eight for overall performance. 
where the numbers were low is the interstation correlation or the interstation reliability. So how somebody performed on one station wasn't predictive of how somebody performed on another station, which is exactly what we are talking about in terms of the importance of multiple independent samples in a variety of different situations. In terms of overall reliability, we had reasonable reliability overall with seven stations. What we found is we did a decision study, which is that same thing I was talking about earlier, which allows us to calculate what the reliability would be uh, if we were able to use 10 stations. And we found the reliability went to a much more acceptable range. The reliability isn't uh, associated with the test itself. It's associated with the test in the population that you're applying it in. So because we were doing this at the postgraduate level, where the applicants coming in are much more homogeneous, they're harder to tell apart. So you may need more stations or different types of stations. Yes, sir? Originally, you talked about the fact that two stations don't do anything, and nine's great, one better. But is there a number, like a minimum number? Because I was thinking about our own admissions process, we probably have like four people in the room on any given day. Mm -hmm. To make it more would be very logistically difficult. And it could be done. But is there, is there a number where it sort of leaps up and says, um, Any time you can add one more station or one more room, it's worth doing um, from a reliability standpoint. Once you get up to 9 or 10, you may not see as big a bang for your buck by adding one more, but if you're talking about 4 or 5, by adding one more, you're going to see a huge jump in terms of reliability. At what level are you doing the assessment? Like, is it post-grad or...? The station, yes, they're much shorter, so they're 10 minutes. Would that be a number that would make sense? It's probably better than, it's better than what we're doing now, but not as good as 10. Exactly, and uh, there's always a balance because, I mean, you can always try and achieve ideal reliability, but it has to be balanced with feasibility. Right now at McMaster, um, we have 4,500 applicants each year. We interview 540. Uh, and that occurs over two interview weekends with seven circuits of the MMI running at the same time over the course of three days. Two weekends, so over three days. We run 540 people through. We've got it down to a bit of a science now. But, uh... You have not employed the students in your program. Many admissions that they used to Is there some reason why students are not part of your evaluation process? Students are, in fact. We, uh, in terms of the raters, we tend to have, um, at the postgraduate level, we either have faculty and residents as raters. At the undergraduate level, uh, for the MMI, we can have faculty, community members, or uh, medical students or residents as interviewers. Uh, we train them up. Uh, some of them, we have interactive stations where there's actually a, it's, it's like a standardized patient in the room, but it's, it's not a clinical scenario. Um, so one example is, um, you're getting ready to go to a business meeting and somebody is in the room. Uh, you walk in the room and it's Sarah who's in the room and Sarah needs to be down there for this big business meeting otherwise your company may be folding. Uh, you Both of you are going to lose your jobs as well as many other people. Sarah's refusing to fly. So how do you get Sarah onto that plane? Um, and so in that case we sometimes have a medical student playing the role of Sarah or something. So they are very engaged in that process. Um, in terms of acceptability, and this is at the postgraduate level, 88% um, of applicants felt they were able to give an accurate portrayal of themselves, which is important. Um, there was a huge concern moving from undergraduate to postgraduate. Postgraduate, we have to do a lot of recruiting um, at the same time because we're trying to get them to rank our program very high. So because they're only given these short scenarios in which to present themselves, we want to make sure they could present themselves accurately. 65% uh, felt there was more stress going into it. Um, that was at the beginning, and at the end, most of them felt very comfortable with it. Most of them didn't know the MMI at the beginning. 81% uh, would not be less willing to apply to a program. In terms of the evaluators, they felt... Would be less willing to apply. Yes, and, but for us, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because those are the potentially 19% who wouldn't rank us very high anyway. 
we asked them afterwards. Uh, these were what we were able to do uh, is look at these people and based on their medical school of origin. Most of these people were from UBC or uh, the East Coast, so Memorial or Dalhousie, and they were people who wouldn't want to leave their school. When you look at the Ontario-based medical schools, which is where we're from, there's, there's five medical schools there, all of them would not be less willing to apply, and that's where we draw our key residence pool from. We don't know about them, um, but from the way things are going, increasingly postgraduate programs are using this as their admissions tools, so they're not getting away from it. Once people have done it, they've said it's actually, once they've gone through it and been exposed to it, they say it's actually less stressful than having a panel of people staring at them um, because they actually get to refresh themselves. The other thing is, um, with any interview, even if you're doing a traditional interview, I encourage people to standardize it. Um, and standardize the questions that are being asked because a lot of the problems can come from inappropriate questions being asked. Yes, to what extent are the universities in Canada using interviews as part of their admissions? Traditional or MMI type interviews? Uh, any. Because I, just like, for example, in the state universities, for the most part, the state universities in New York, right, don't interview at all. If you put in an application, you get accepted, you don't get accepted. Whereas Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I imagine somebody who interviewed for kindergarten, elementary school, high right. school, and college would have been more comfortable in any kind of interview than somebody who had never interviewed before, and whether that played a role in people's perception. Unless they were very, very small schools, we don't tend to interview um, to get into the regular university stream, um, but we interview at the medical school level. So the other thing I just wanted to, last thing I wanted to mention about the MMI is that in terms of diversity, um, there is, uh, the only uh, thing that impacts is actual, actually age. So the older you are, the better you tend to do on the multiple mini interview, which makes sense. Uh, and in fact, that's the inverse of the, the GPA, so you could say it's a bit of a balancing act because GPA, you tend to be higher if you're younger. Um, so, but in terms of gender socioeconomic status, um, and that's rural versus urban, and we also used our, our postal code, our equivalent to the zip code, uh, to be able to match economic status, and we found there was no difference in performance across that, uh, across race as reported, um, and disability accommodation. So now that I have talked to you, I'm not sure what time it is, but now that I've talked to you about that, uh, I just want to take you quickly through the next stop. So we've talked about the qualities that may be of interest in practicing physician, how that relates to national licensing exam performance, the components of knowledge versus the personal professional qualities. We know GPA and MCAT will predict for the knowledge component. And the MMI does predict for the C2-LEO or clinical decision making um, or the personal professional qualities. But we haven't talked about pre-interview selection. So at Big Master, for example, we have 42 to 4,500 applicants, how do we decide of those applicants which are the 540 that we're going to be able to interview? So I'm going to go through this component very briefly because I want to get on to the last part. Um, so in 2005, we looked at our autobiographical submission, which were five short essay questions that people had to write pre-interview. They had three months to write the answers to these questions uh, and submit them, and it was a combination of that and undergraduate GPA which determined who actually came in for an interview. So uh, in 2005, we actually had everybody who came in to do the multiple mini interview sit down again and rewrite an autobiographical submission. So they had to do an on-site ABS to look at the difference. There were two things that we looked at. We used to have a traditional scoring method, so it marked all five questions ac across applicant. So each applicant, applicant that came in, they would, their package would be given to one evaluator who would see if their responses to all five questions. Uh, the problem we found with that is that we were concerned we were getting a huge halo effect. So that unintentional first impression bias that I can't talk to you about was happening in our autobiographical submission. Our inter-rater reliability was pretty low uh, 
in our traditional ABS and the internal consistency, so the correlation between questions was really, really high and we thought that was artificial, potentially imposed by that halo effect. We also had a situation where what we were using to determine who came to interview had absolutely no predictive power for how they were due on in medical school or in their licensing exam. So it wasn't really a useful tool. Um, so we had people come in and we did, took a subset of the applicants and we looked at their on-site versus off-site comparisons and we looked at their vertical scoring, so all the way through applicants, their questions one to five, and then we tried a new scoring method which we called the horizontal scoring method. So we actually scored across question, which looked like that. Uh, and what we found is that there was a mean effect of, uh, in terms of the total mean score, it was much higher for those written off-site, but that's prob probably primarily driven by the old scoring system off-site, uh, where people tended to score very high. In terms of reliability, we found that the off-site generally had lower reliability than the on-site, but that the horizontal, so scoring across, across question rather than across applicant, was much, much better. So this led us to a few conclusions. Uh, the first is that uh, the new horizontal scoring method scoring across question gave you more reliable and valid results. But also there was something to be said for having a secure situation in which people were writing their responses. We know that um, in terms of academic honesty, there's been a lot of studies, but 82% of people admit to cheating at some point in their academic career um, during the application or during the process, and that's, uh, that's at varying levels of cheating uh, in terms of the definition. We do know that for our autobiographical submission, people were being hired to write them. Um, we found duplicate responses. We, all of these things that you hope aren't happening, we knew were actually happening, unfortunately. We just couldn't get a handle on how much of it was happening. The other problem is when you give somebody an autobiographical submission with three months to write it, you would think they were silly if they didn't hand it to every person that they knew. Uh, and have them vet it. So how much of what was coming in was actually the applicant themselves writing, how much of it was other people's vetting. So that led us to our next step, which was the development of the computer-based assessment for sampling personal characteristics, or CASPER. Um, and some of this research has been funded by the Medical Council of Canada and the Stemler uh, organization, so I do want to acknowledge them. So this was a total leap of faith for us. Um, and the CASPER format is an online testing format where there are eight video vignettes and four self-descriptive questions. They're all aimed to be non-clinical. There are three follow-up questions after the self-descriptive question or the video vignette. They have five minutes to type their response to these three follow-up questions. And they're scored independently at a later time by two raters. So this is done online in a secure environment at their home, the university, wherever they want. Um, and we have test security measures to check and see if that is the person writing. The reason for the five minutes, we did do a study where we allowed them 10 minutes and we found that we lost dramatically in terms of our reliability and validity. When you give somebody five minutes to answer three questions, I'll give you some examples and, and you'll see for yourselves, but you don't have time to input anything else that anybody else is saying to you. It doesn't matter if you have 10 people standing in the room with you, if you're typing your responses that fast, you don't have time to interpret what they're saying. So in terms of a self-descriptive question, this is one example. So think about one of the most stressful situations you've personally encountered. We would then ask them to have five minutes to type the responses to, describe the situation and how you overcame it, what did you learn in this situation, and in retrospect, how might you respond differently, and what would you do if one of your classmates were suffering from stress? So they had five minutes to answer those questions, and that's just one example. In terms of the videos, I'll just play you a really brief example. I see that my colleague, Dr. Jones, has reviewed your file, examined you, and has recommended that surgery not be performed. Is that correct? Do you call this meeting because you wish to discuss this further? Yes, I definitely want that back surgery. But according to the reports, the risks involved with the surgery are very high. Not only does your cardiac condition indicate that there will be difficulty keeping you alive, but the surgery itself often results in paralysis. All this risk for a small chance that your lower back pain would be reduced. 
I can understand why Dr. Jones would not wish to perform the surgery. The benefit in this case certainly does not outweigh the risk. I heard what the risks are. I understand them. It's my body. It's my life. And I want the surgery. You don't know how this back pain has ruined my career, my marriage, my life. I'm sorry, but in all good conscience, I can't support proceeding with this risky operation either. With all due respect, doctor, we aren't arguing the risks. We understand the risks and we're willing to take them. Dr. Jones has the highest success rate of anyone else around for this type of surgery. And Dr. Jones is the one we want to perform the surgery. Having anyone else do this surgery will only increase the risk. So there's no point in a second opinion. Dr. Jones, will you perform this surgery? So all of these videos are filmed from the perspective of the applicant. So in this case, they're given the, the role that you're Dr. Jones, so you saw the camera not along. After they saw that video, they had five minutes to type their answers to, you must make your decision now, what's your answer and why. Um, should, should instances like this relieve the surgeon of all liability in this case and why? And should the patient be allowed to sue the surgeon if they refuse to operate in this circumstance? Defend your response. So this is just one example of many that we have. Um, in Canada, one of our uh, identified populations is our Aboriginal population. So each year we have at least one video representing uh, an Aboriginal cultural issue um, that they need to have sensitivity to. So I can show you examples if we have time later. Um, in terms of evaluation, all three responses are scored on a nine-point Likert scale. Um, two raters evaluate at their convenience, so the rating system is all online. The raters are sent a link and they complete their rater training online and then complete all the evaluations. Uh, in terms of, I've just provided a quick summary here of all of the results. Um, so this is a combination of uh, study one, which was conducted, and study two were both conducted pre-interview, so these were just with subpopulations to examine the reliability and validity. And in the last two years, this has been the format that we've used to test applicants pre-interview at McMaster for entry to undergraduate training. So the overall reliability uh, has been quite high uh, across all four years, and including when it's been actually applied in practice with our applicants' pools. Our inter-rater reliability uh, has been quite good to the point that we're actually going to decrease to one rater next year. So we only need one rater and it decreases our resources dramatically. And in terms of correlation with the MMI, we don't have longitudinal data yet on CASPER to look at how performance is on national licensing exams. So we're using the MMI as a surrogate. So we know it correlates with performance on the, on the MMI, which then correlates to performance on national licensing exams. So it gives us some very positive hopes for being able to evaluate personal and professional characteristics pre-interview uh, in a format that's not too resource intensive um, from a faculty perspective. So just in terms of some final thoughts, there are many potential advantages to being able to accurately assess all candidates on measures beyond just the cognitive realm. Um, the qualities that you're looking at may be unique to each school or discipline. Uh, the number of scenarios has to be based on the feasibility for your particular program. But either way, multiple sampling is an important of our aspect of our training. And this is from admissions all the way through to faculty development. So I'd like to thank you all so very much for your time and for inviting me and ask if you have any other questions.